Lisa, thank you so much. I have been waiting to have this conversation with you and I could not be more grateful and excited to have this time with you. So thank you so much for making the time to be here with me. Um, me also. Thanks, Roxy. I've, um, I've been waiting for this too. I know it's, a, it's been a long time coming. Yeah, you are a busy woman. So I want to get us right into it. I actually want to start with, this is a piece of uh, a caption that you put out on Instagram and it really just, it just hit my heart. I want to read it to you so I don't mess it up. Uh, but you were, you started by saying, I'm a lifelong, qu- I'm on a lifelong quest to discover what actually drives human performance in pro athletes. Mm. And, you know, everything that uh, I put out on my podcast is all, you know, with this idea of how do we get 1% better human potential. So I'm curious, I want to start with where did that even stem from? Like what drove you to a become a neuroscientist and specifically neurophysiologist? Uh, where does this come from in your life? What are your backstory? You know, what I, I wasn't this type of person growing up. I was very girly and very, um, I, I was very different growing up, but I think at around 15, I started competitively swimming and I decided at around 17, which is going dating back a long time now, I decided to do a triathlon uh, just to, you know, see what I could do. And I ended up coming first and I was picked up by a triathlon coach. And I, I bring this story up because I started my triathlon career at the age of 17. And, um, you know, my story is I, I qualified for Beijing and, Lon- and London and Auckland. And I ended up racing um, for Australia. And I was training as a full-time athlete. It was 40 hours a week. So I really had to endure a lot. I was going to school at the same time. I was understanding what it took to become an elite athlete, but not in just one sport. We had to become elite athletes in three legs, swim, bike, run. So I was constantly on this quest to find out how can I get better? How can I get better? How can I get better? And it wasn't until 2011, I actually got hit by a car and I was traveling at around 40 kilometers an hour. The, I can't do the quick math in two miles. Um, And there was a car traveling, you know, at three times the speed and he couldn't see where he was driving too fast. And he actually slammed me into a guardrail. So I had to forfeit my title and, you know, legs were smashed, bike was smashed, arms were smashed. So it was a really scary period of my life. And Triathlon Australia ended up hiring a coach uh, to come and see me. And this coach said something really profound. This was in 2011. And he said, the only way that you're ever going to get back on a bike is not through training. It's not through rehabilitation. He said, it's going to be through your brain. I was like, well, what does that mean? And he said, I'm going to hook you up to this thing called an EEG. And we're going to put caps on your head and I'm going to record your brain waves. I'm going to show you what's possible for you to go on and, you know, go through to the next round of, um, you know, the following year and qualify. I thought you're out of your mind. Um, And that's when I was first introduced to an EEG and I ended up qualifying again the year before and I came 12th and that's when I called it quits in 2012. But I decided then that everything I did in terms of rehabilitation, getting back on a bike and racing after a traumatic injury like that really comes down to the neurology of an athlete. So that's when I decided to dedicate my entire life to understanding the brain. And it's my, it's my greatest love affair. That's amazing. I mean, not, first of all, it's hardcore that you got hit by a car and that happened. It's so interesting though. I mean, I talked to so many people and I know even in my own life, you know, I, my passion for just like everything, biology, physiology, uh, nutrigenomics, like how food affects us, neuroscience, where did that really stem from? Three knee surgeries and a lot of shit that took place in my body after that when I was a teenager, right? So pain, um, can really be a strong catalyst for an individual to find passion and purpose. And one thing I just want to say right now, you know, the start of the conversation, one thing that I really love about you and what you share is I can really feel the authenticity in your desire to support individuals with your content. So I know that so much of your career is focused around, you know, high performers and athletes. But when I listen to you on Clubhouse, and you're really the only person I listen to, um, you know, some of the conversations are more broad there. And it's just, I can really feel that in you. So 
just want to say that, and then we can dive into all the, I'm very excited to pick at your brain right now. Um, so on the topic of brain, I mean, I have this whole tagline, um, age like a badass, right? And that doesn't mean just stay, you know, small and body composition, that's important. I'm really thinking about cognition. I'm thinking about if we are lucky enough to make it into, you know, these later decades of life, can we function cognitively like a badass? And if we can, what do we need to be doing in our lives right now? You know, I'm in my forties, midlife, um, and even earlier on, what are the things that we need to be paying attention and doing to mm. achieve that? Um, mm. I think a great place to start in that area, if you're cool with it is just, you know, what are some of the things that you're what are some of the greatest levers that you have been seeing in your career that actually, you know, people who are doing it right, people who are taking care of themselves in the right way, specifically their brain, that they're able to perform, not just necessarily as an athlete, but just in life in general at a very high mm -hmm. level. Mm. All right. So let's, you know, let's take, for example, a centenarian. Let's take a, somebody who's lived to 100 and we can assess this patient and say, well, Jack, for example, Jack is 101 and he's living well. He's able to walk with his kids and his grandkids, maybe his great grandkids. He's able to uh, sit down and stand back up. He's able to read a book and he's able to communicate with you effectively. It's like, well, what does that take? And if we reverse engineer that, and there's been a lot of uh, studies and some great labs, uh, David Sinclair has been focusing on this, you know, what does it take to really age well? And that goes into the area of medicine called longevity. So there's so many different biomarkers that we can look at that says, these are the things that we need to be doing every single day, periodically, to age well, and they involve interventions around exercise, some form of cognitive training where, you know, something that's going to be demanding uh, mentally for you and what you eat. I really think that they're the three pillars for longevity. So let's, you know, cut a slice of that and look at the brain. Uh, early on in my career, I was doing a lot of Alzheimer's disease uh, work, research manuscripts. I was looking at early detection or early onset Alzheimer's disease with an EEG. And that's my primary modality right now. You know, an EEG is an electroencephalogram where you put it on your head. In Australia, we use a 1020 system. So you put these electrodes on your head and you can do specific things or you can just sit there and it takes a reading of your brain. And with Alzheimer's disease, there is no cure. Um, and in order to really detect Alzheimer's disease, you do have to have you know, many different tests done. But to, to detect memory issues and cognitive impairment, we can do that with an EEG. And so that's what I was doing. And I, and I found some, so many fascinating things. And when we look at cognitive impairment as the brain ages, it's interesting to see where this cohort of individuals, like what are they doing? What are they eating? And let's, let's assume that somebody uh, doesn't have uh, the alleles or the genes to get Alzheimer's disease, okay? Mm -hmm. Let's say that they're clear from that and that it's just lifestyle factors that has uh, given them, you know, they've gone backwards in their brain aging pretty much. So what do they look like? Well, it means that they're having a lot of lack of sleep. So sleep mm -hmm. prevention. I sleep, I talk about sleep so often. Sleep, I think, is one of the most underrated high performance tools that we have. It can help you age backwards. So sleep is where we're going wrong in terms of aging well cognitively and overall. We'll go into sleep later on. Um, nutrition. And when I talk about nutrition, I'm not so much talking about what you eat. I not just what you eat, but also the quantity, the quality, the timing. Um, you know, who you are as an individual, what are your lab work? So everything around that. And then also exercise. I think it's imperatively important to be exercising, even if it is 15 minutes a day. And then also the form of exercise that you're doing. So you could, you know, your guests or your community could think this girl thinks that we're all doctors or we all have our own personalized board of directors to look after our health. And it's not like that. However, I 
I do caution what I say by, by telling everybody, sometimes you do have to become your own physician or your own, um, uh, whatever you want to call it, your own health practitioner. Yeah, no, I so agree with that. I always say like, you have to be your own bodyguard, right? Cause there's yeah. always things that are going to be happening to us as we're moving through yeah. life. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Can we dive into sleep? Cause that is one of my favorite topics that you talk about that I just specifically like the way you communicate about it. I remember you posted something not that long ago, you mentioned like everyone's looking, so many people are looking for, um, you know, like the latest nootropic yeah. And you're like, you mentioned sleep and maybe even sunlight or something. So let's dive into that because I thought that was so true. First of all, I know, I, I know in my own life, the difference of when I'm on, I track my sleep, when I have a great, oh, you're wearing sleep, a whoop watch. I see. Is that a whoop? No, it look it looks like it. It's actually a Fitbit. And I just ordered an aura ring because, and I want to talk to you about this because I really, I want to get a good, I want to understand my HRV. I want to tap oh, okay. into That's that. That's a great so, thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about sleep first. Yes. Okay. Yes, please. Any specific questions? Well, okay. So let's start with the, we, a lot of people here. Oh, I eight hours of sleep. That's important. Can we talk about the quality of sleep and break down? What yeah. does that even mean? Yeah, yeah. That's a great question. So, uh, we have been really misinformed as individuals in society, uh, for a long time now, probably since technology was invented, where we were under the notion that we sleep when we're dead and we don't need to sleep. I function well without it. Well, no, there's, a, there's so much research now that has gone into showing that sleep is a fundamental part of human existence, not just for because we need to do it, but because it's responsible for so many genes in our body. So let's start off with the quality of sleep. We have sleep stages, okay? And they're broken down into two specific themes, non-REM sleep and REM sleep. So REM stands for rapid eye movement. So in the first three stages of when we fall asleep, we're in non-REM sleep, okay? So that's when we go in, we, the first half an hour, we're kind of dozing off and then we go further and further and then we hit REM sleep. And during REM sleep, you know, if you see it on an EEG, it's like these big, big, amazing waves, delta waves. But what that really is doing, if you've ever, and you can probably vouch for this, have you ever had crazy dreams where it's like, oh, I was on a roller coaster and then a spider came. It's like really weird, mm -hmm. crazy. That's happening in REM sleep. So if you're dreaming, it's like, well, that's great. I hit my REM sleep. And REM is incredibly important for neurological function, um, for memory consolidation. If you've ever woken up with brain fog, it's probably because you didn't get a good night's sleep. But I think, um, you know, a lot of things that I see on social media, I don't really, you know, buy into it unless it's been uh, backed by, by research. But we all say we want REM sleep. And if you look at our watches, if you look at your, I don't know what a Fitbit is, but if you look at the work, it focuses a lot on REM sleep. And I think we should be focusing on slow wave sleep and slow wave sleep is part of the, the first stages of sleep. And the reason being is that it's twofold. First of all, if you ever wanted a fountain of youth, okay, if you ever wanted a tablet that is like the fountain of youth, you were talking about longevity, you wanna be optimizing for slow wave sleep. During slow wave sleep, we have, that's where all of our IGF secretion occurs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I won't go into what that is, but this is where it predominantly occurs. And another really interesting thing happens. So it, I think it's been about 20 years that scientists discovered this system called the glymphatic system. And the glymphatic system is, is like a sewerage system in your brain. And it's somewhat like the lymphatic system in our body where, you know, you go and get a lymphatic massage and you massage the, you know, the lymph and it gets rid of the toxins. Yeah. We have the same thing for our brain and it's called the glymphatic system only recognized or, or coined about 20 something years ago. And what they found was when we go into deep sleep, deep, slow wave sleep, our brain deploys this, this mechanism where it's it, the, the, the cerebral spinal fluid comes in and it's really smart. It comes in and it goes through and it goes through all the little vessels and it clears through all the gunk and the toxins. 
the toxins that are built up from the environment, the toxins that are built up from lack of sleep, the toxins, and the metabolites that are built up from the food that we're ingesting or drinking or whatever it is that we're doing, you're just stuck there, right? But if you're getting yeah. into slow wave sleep, you're cleaning it up. So you wake up and you feel fresh. So that is so powerful because you know what else it's doing? It's also clearing out these proteins called tau proteins. Now, earlier you mentioned, well, what's cognitive impairment? And if anybody knows what cognitive impairment is or Alzheimer's disease, Alzheimer's disease is caused by the phosphorylation of tau protein. So it's a certain type of protein that gets built up, okay, in the brain. And what happens is it starts to form these plaques. It gets clogged up. So therefore, blood can't flow properly. And this is why sleep deprivation is closely linked to Alzheimer's disease patients. And also, if you look at Alzheimer's disease patients, once they're diagnosed, Alzheimer's disease happens, you know, it starts to happen 20 years before the diagnosis. So you look back in time and you ask these patients, were you sleeping? They're like, I haven't slept. I can't sleep. And it's very interesting. It's like, well, so we really, if anybody's out there and they're thinking, why am I waking up with brain fog? Why am I not thinking clear? Why do I feel like this? We really need to be optimizing for these sleep stages. Okay. So I hope like, you know, just, you know, I ramble a lot, but I hope I've just really outlined the importance of sleep. And I really want to finish off this section by saying there was an article, I bring this up in almost all my clubhouses, uh, but there was an article that was produced um, in a very high quality stringent journal, PNAS. And what they did was they grew, they took a group of healthy adults Uh, 20 adults and they deprived them of sleep for just one week. Okay. Just seven days, deprived them of sleep and they deprived them down to six hours a night. Okay. A lot of us may think, well, that's what I get on a daily basis. That's actually sleep deprivation. And guess what they saw after just one week of sleep deprivation, they saw an epigenetic change of 3%. So you guys can do the math. We have a um, we have twenty thousand genes in the human genome. Three percent of that is what around seven hundred genes. Let's just say, that's huge. So from sleep deprivation, you are impairing three percent of your entire genome. I, I that is mind boggling. And just to let you know, the the genes that were actually disrupted, so the ones that were upregulated were the tumor. Were the, were, the, wow. were the genes responsible for tumor growth and the ones that were down-regulated were the immunity genes. So with wow. sleep deprivation of just one week, you're increasing your chances of, of getting a tumor and you're decreasing your immunity. This is why sometimes we get sick when we don't sleep. And I think that's right. so fundamental. And knowing everything I just said, everybody should be thinking, how the hell do I optimize, optimize for sleep? My sleep. Yeah. Oh my yeah. God. No, that's that. First of all, that's insane. Yeah. Um, second of all, I think I, I, I love everything you just laid out. I want to tease apart one aspect because, okay. I know so many people who are like, oh yeah, you know, I'll go to bed at 12, one o'clock and then they'll sleep oh, yeah. in not the same thing. No. Can you explain that please? Cause that's yeah. so important. It's so common. Yeah, it is. And, um, you know, I'd be lying if I said that I have been sticking to my routine. I haven't. Um, The first thing (laughs) is uh, the brain is an adaptive device. Okay. It responds to what it's given. It's not a fixed device. So it likes consistency. That's the one thing I can tell you. The brain would love it if you could do the exact same thing all day, every day, go to sleep at 10 PM and wake up at 7 AM. So I'm not going to talk about timing of sleep in terms of how many hours you should get. I think that's very individualized starting at seven and a half hours and above. Uh, But what I can tell you is we all have this 24 hour clock in our brain. Okay. And it's really regulated by the sun. And when the sun goes up, our brain knows to, you know, if, if we get direct sunlight, our brain knows. So it knows when you're going to sleep at midnight and it, you're not getting the, the necessary sleep. You're not getting into those deep sleep stages if you're sleeping past 11 p.m. And there's been so many several studies to show that if you're actually looking at any form of light between the hours of 11 p.m. and 4 a.m., you're actually activating a certain area in your brain that's responsible for depressive-like symptoms. So once you, active, once you 
brain once you're once light is in your brain between the hours of 11 p.m and 4 a.m you're actually not helping yourself at all you're actually telling your brain hey i'm awake you're telling your brain that tomorrow we're going to be lethargic and it just shuts down so many different things that are responsible for being happy being motivated being driven so the timing of your sleep does really matter and would you say is this true that you know um light after sun, so I'm, and I, I want to tap into this with you because it's such a big subject that I love to talk about as well, like light information, right? Um, you know, when the sun sets in my own life and, you know, I'm fortunate, I'm not a mom. And so I can be, uh, you know, more specific with my kind of evening. I have an evening ritual. I have a morning and an evening ritual. And I don't like lights. I have pink Himalayan sea salt lamps. I have candles, but I really get into that like warm tone of light. Um, is it true that bright lights later after sunset in the dark are telling your melatonin levels to um, stay down and keeping your cortisol, the cortisol hormones to stay, to be elevated, which obviously is promoting, you know, you to stay awake, the individual to stay awake. Is that true? Yes. So first of all, let's understand what melatonin is. It's a hormone that is secreted in response to darkness. Okay. So it doesn't get, it, it, it gets blocked. It attenuates, it gets blocked when it sees light. Okay. So let's, let's just know that. And, and it's responsible for making us sleepy and tired. And let's, so let's just know that first. So once you wake up in the morning, in order to really activate this 24 hour clock in this circadian rhythm, we have to have access to bright light and you think during a pandemic, we wake up and maybe we turn the lights on and we think we're activating our, our internal clock. But it turns out that in order to really activate this internal clock and tell the body we're awake, secrete a little bit of cortisol, let's stay awake uh, so we can go on hunt and fight and, and run away from a tiger. You actually have to get 10,000 lux of light. And so lux is just a, a measure of light waves and you have to get a specific type of light. So it can't be a light from television screen or the or the overhead lights in your apartment it has to be 10,000 lux of light from the sun so in order to really activate this you have to go outside and activate your your system by getting bright light that's the first thing and then as the night goes on and as the sun goes down it's it's also really great to be staring at you know those you know, those rays and those colors of the sun as it's going down mm -hmm. your body's starting to wind down and when the sun is fully down that's when your body thinks, oh, it's time to go back to my cave and start to fall asleep. Nowadays, what we're doing is we're looking at our phone. Now, when you've been up all day, we have certain cells in our eyes, okay, photoreceptors. They're responsible for detecting bright light. They're responsible for detecting darkness. We've got ones that are specifically for melatonin, okay, the melanopsin cells. And so they're, they're located specifically at the bottom of the retina. And what happens is as soon as they are triggered, okay, or turned on, which they're turned on by the sun, as soon as they're turned on, they're saying to us, we're awake. So if you're at home and you're looking at a light, you're telling your, your brain, okay, because remember, you've got your eyes, your eyes via the optic nerve goes into the, the visual cortex at the back of the brain. So it's all connected. You're telling your brain, I am awake. So what does that mean? That means your brain is saying, hey, guys, we're awake. Let's start to secrete some, some cortisol. Let's, you know, adrenaline, let's start to do things as if we're awake. And then we think that we can just shut our phone off and go into sleep. And a lot of people think, well, yeah, I, I'm fine. I watch TV and then I sleep, but no, you may be going to sleep, but you're not getting into those deep sleep stages. So you're really having this cycle. And this cycle is like, well, I didn't sleep last night. So I'm going to wake up. I'm going to feel a bit, a bit crappy. And then the cycle happens again. So to the answer your question, yes, because if melatonin is responsible, uh, is you know gets secreted in response to darkness, and you've got bright light there, it's not going to secrete melatonin. Okay, it's going to yeah. block it, so you're not going to be getting into those deep sleep stages. What are you? What are the? Um, I, I mean, I know it's going to vary for everybody, um, but in terms of getting optimal amounts of deep sleep, REM sleep. Can you throw out some numbers? Cause I never see that. I'm like, I get about yeah. two hours of REM and on a great 
day of deep, it's like an hour and a half to two. And I'm, I always get more REM than deep, which I'm an athlete, not competitive, but I'm like, oh, I want more deep, you know, cause yeah. restorative. Yeah. So you should be aiming for your, your total REM sleep to be 20% of your total sleep time. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So if you cool. look at your REM sleep and you see that it's, you know, two hours, and then you look at that in comparison to your total sleep, aim for 20 minutes because that's the, that's the good dosage. Okay, cool. Um, let me ask you this because, yeah. you know, okay, listen, there's, you know, people in their twenties and we know, I mean, I remember my twenties living in New York city, my, my sleep was not happening basically. Um, but I've completely reverse that my lifestyle, like, you know, is not as far from that, but let's think about a new parent or something. Can any of the detriments of, um, not getting great sleep be reversed? You know, so many, as so many mothers ask this question and it's like a, it's like a plea. They're like, Oh, but I, it's not my fault. I'm like, okay. I'm like, calm down. So sleep is not like a debt. It's not like, it's not like a bank where you can just repay the debt. Okay. You can't, it's like with any, any neurodegenerative disease, once you get it, it's, it's more so about great. We've got it. What are the lifestyle interventions that we have to do to either uh, stop the ongoing, you know, stop the progression or slow the progression, I should say. So with sleep, you can't get back missed sleep. This is why um, I tell a lot of, I've got a lot of 16 year old boys who I, who come into neuroathletics. I'm trying to tell them, you know, get it right now, because as soon as the brain is developed at around 24, 25, you can't really do anything from there. So I, you, you can't reverse it. You can't, you know, binge sleep during the week and expect to make it up on the weekend. So if you are a mother and you are going through this, um, this natural thing that we're, you know, a lot of us will probably go through in, in our lives, you just have to, you know, there's always a good time to get on a sleep protocol and that's just something yeah. that you have to do. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for, but you can't go back into type. Yeah, no, can't. no. <laughs> okay. So one of the other things that I'm really excited to talk to you about in this conversation is neuroinflammation and the connection to depression. Can we dive into that? Yes, we can. And I'm so happy that you brought that up because just recently I had the privilege of sitting down with a wonderful man. Um, he's a board certified psychiatrist and his name is Dr. Charles Raison. And his research, uh, his research is focused on the relationship between inflammation or neural inflammation, by the way, neuro and neural, exactly same thing. So um, his, his, his work is focused on neural inflammation as it relates to depression and also decreasing inflammation to alleviate some depressive like symptoms via heat therapy. Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. So whole body hypothermia. So let me just, let's talk about what inflammation is. Cause I think it's this, it's this term that gets thrown around when we hear the word cortisol. And when we hear the word inflammation, we, we kind of think don't want too much cortisol because they don't want to be inflamed, but pretty much inflammation is it's an inflammatory response, neural inflammation, inflammatory response within the brain and spinal cord. And it's really mediated by these things called cytokines and many other different things that we're not really going to go into. So what Charles did was he was seeing many, many different patients, okay, who were being diagnosed with, uh, you know, it's clinical depression, okay, from other doctors or by himself. So this, he, he mentioned that the standard protocol was you come into the office, you tick off 10 or so boxes and, you know, these boxes or through this questionnaire and with, you know, in discussion with this patient, he has, you know, he has clinical depression. I'm going to put him on an SSRI such as Prozac. Okay. So then they go on Prozac, serotonin reuptake. So it's like, okay, we're going to get them, you know, out of depression in the hopes of getting them out of depression by this single pill. And he thought, well, what, what is the similarities with my depressive, with my patients who have got depression and with, you know, a, you know, 20 patients who don't have depression. So this was the study. He had a cohort of, uh, of patients who didn't have depression. They were just healthy adults. Then he had a cohort of patients who had clinical depression and who were on some form of SSRI. He did blood work for all of them. What he found was that the ones with depression had elevated biomarkers of inflammation, okay? So these people had 
high inflammation. Now, how do we figure out what high inflammation is via a blood test? We can go and do, we can test for um, interleukin-6, which is, uh, you know, or C-reactive protein. We can go and test for C-reactive protein, which is a measure of inflammation in the blood. That's what he did. He took a number of different lab results, number of different biomarkers to show that, hey, these, these people have, all these depressed uh, patients have high levels of inflammation. Okay. So that's what he first figured out. Then he thought, how can I, if I decrease this, would it have an effect on how they feel? Would their depression go away or would their depressive like symptoms be decreased? So he started to research and he found that whole body hypothermia, which is when you get your entire body to a certain temperature, I believe I'm don't quote me because I'm talking in Fahrenheit. I believe it's 101 um, Fahrenheit, but when you get it to a certain temperature for five times a week for an hour, five times a week, it decreases the level of inflammation and it does this via heat shock proteins. Okay. So once your body gets to a certain temperature, whether it's, whether it's hypothermic or hyperthermic, like whether you're going to a cold bath or whether you're in heat stress, our body starts to um, secrete heat shock proteins or cold shock proteins, okay, in response to what is happening in the body. And these heat shock proteins go and they they do certain things. And what they did was they actually lowered, okay, these inflammatory biomarkers. So he put them on a protocol and he also put the um uh, he also put the, the 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 cohort of patients who were who didn't have any depression in there as well, just to obviously validate the study. And when these patients with um, elevated inflammation, when they had a decreased, like he took their blood work and they all had normal levels of, of inflammation, everybody's levels came down from going into a sauna, an infrared sauna. Mm-hmm. They felt better, and they actually mimicked this was the really important thing they actually mimicked the exact same response that the ssri does so he wow. was getting the exact same results from prozac as what he was getting with these patients going into a sauna and that is you know it, it's providing such beneficial therapeutic i would say like a therapeutic option for people who have got clinical depression now You may say, well, why would somebody want to go and put themselves into extreme heat when they can just take a Prozac? And that's a a question for a later conversation. But I do believe, however, that just because a drug um, has an effect on you in terms of if you you say an SSRI, if it's going in to your system and it's having an effect and helping you feel better, increasing serotonin um, and getting you out of depression, it's probably doing a number of other things too, such as interfering with the gut microbiome. And so he's just figuring out ways of bringing a more therapeutic approach to such a devastating disease, such as depression. So I hope that answers your question that there is now a proven study that has shown that there is a, a very clear link between inflammation and depression. Now let's go back to neural inflammation. When I said that it's, you know, basically the inflammatory response within the brain and spinal cord, um, which is mediated by certain cytokines. Well, then how do we decrease that? Well, the things that actually increase these neural inflammatory biomarkers are lack of sleep, are are different types of foods that you're eating. The foods that we eat, such as sugar, sugar, refined sugar, I should say, is extremely detrimental um, you know, to the brain and to the body in terms of inflammation. So you're up, you know, you're going upstream with all of these um, mediators. So it's exactly what I say, even lack of exercise. So, or too much exercise. So I think, you know, if we put all this together, it's like, well, how do I want to feel better? Okay. If you want to feel better through science, it's very possible. You just start to adopt a protocol, which involves sleep, good nutrition and getting out into nature. So it's so important. And the sugar piece is so huge because I know, um, uh, you know, oftentimes we're hearing a lot, like Alzheimer's is like type three diabetes because it's insulin oh, yes. resistance in the brain. Right. Cause mm-hmm. I, and you answered, you touched on it, but I was going to ask you, you know, what are some of the leading causes to neuroinflammation? And it's, would you say it's essentially lifestyle, right? Oh, absolutely. Lifestyle factors. And also I think, um, you know, we, 
as humans, we have this beautiful, beautiful thing called the nervous system. The nervous system is separated into the central nervous system, which is the brain, the, the brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, which is all of those those nerves, you know, all the little things that come off the spinal cord and then connect to our organs and the rest of our body. Now, I think what we're doing in life and as humans is we're trying to we're trying to balance out between the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. Okay. The fight or flight and the rest and digest. And when we're activating the, 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 the sympathetic nervous system, when we get stressed, for example, mm-hmm. when we get over aroused, when we just, when we don't sleep much, that's, you know, that's another thing that's really aiding in the, in the inflammation process too. So it's really about how do we manage stress better um, and how do we manage our arousal and bring us back down to that equilibrium? And it really is through the, the interventions that I said, even deep breathing and meditation, you know, really does wonders. Well, I wanted to ask you, you know, as someone who studies the brain for a living, your passion, your purpose, like what do you personally do to manage your stress levels and to help your brain, you know, age well and stay healthy and, you know, decreased, you know, inflammation. Um, Mm. what are some of your, your methods, your protocols? So I always believe that the moment you wake up, you're optimizing for sleep. So I, first thing I do when I, when I wake up is I do go outside and I look up at the sky. I don't look directly at the sun. Um, but I do go outside and I take a moment to open up and just, you know, open up my, my circadian rhythm. That's, I, I'm a firm believer of that. So I really go outside and that's the very first thing I do in the morning. I used to deploy a, a morning routine where I would wake up and I would do my, my 10 minutes of meditation and I would do this. And then I would do my power statements. And I don't do that anymore, not because of anything bad, but it's more so around timing. So that's the, the very first thing I do. I exercise on a daily basis. Even when I don't have time, I try and do 15 minutes of really high intensity and a kind, you know, that even mimics uh, long forms of exercise. Um, I obviously, I sleep well. There are certain uh, supplements that I take and it's really fitted for me. I do my labs every six weeks. If you do have Clubhouse, I, I've put my, my lab work on my Clubhouse. Um, so every six weeks I'm checking that. Um, I don't drink too much alcohol. I never have. Um, And if I do, I have a glass of wine. Uh, Wine and any type of alcohol is really detrimental and actually sedates you and blocks you from getting into slow wave and REM sleep. So I try and stay away from um, of alcohol at night. So I don't interfere with that. And look, I'm overall, you know, I was born and raised in Australia to immigrant parents. um, And I've always had a a very good diet in terms of I, I eat you know, I, I eat well and um, I, I'm fortunate that I've adopted this lifestyle from a young age where I love to exercise. I love to be out in nature. I do like to optimize for sleep. I don't, I don't drink. I don't take drugs. I don't smoke. I don't do anything that's really detrimental. Um, I am trying to decrease my sugar intake. Um, <laughs> but one thing that I think is really good for the brain is... Mm-hmm. Uh, so is community and there's a lot of you know there's a lot of uh, laboratories now focusing around socialization and its role in how we feel like in terms of anxiety and how our brain is reshaped and I think that's another area I'm not too well versed in but I'd love to start understanding how people or community or feeling a sense of community and feeling a sense of being part of something uh, has an effect on our brain. So um, that's something that I think we need to be getting into post pandemic. Um, we've, we've seemed to really lock ourselves into a, into a dark room and we don't seem to you know, be getting out and meeting people. So, yeah. Yeah. And there are detriments that are, you know, becoming more and more visible to, you know, in that specific area, you know, people, with social creatures and, you know, I know it in, in the personal sense, and then you see it, you know, happening social media. So, um, yeah, no, it's cool. It's cool to learn your specific protocol because obviously you have like the inside information on what's going on here. And so, um, I, I really value you sharing that. Thank you. I want to talk about, um, 
I want to talk about your company, Neuroathletics. I think it's so badass that you have created this. And can we, can we, let's talk about the, what, what drove you to create this company first and then dive into it a bit. I always imagined, you know, like I said, in my, you know, at the very early part of this podcast, there was a clear link between the brain and sport. And I never knew what that was. I, I just knew that I started to live my life at the intersection of neuroscience and elite athleticism. And I was doing everything to, you know, I was taking, um, you know, back then I was thinking, what can I do to change my brain and how can I live at this intersection to keep moving up and I when I started consulting obviously you know I went to med school and I also wanted to start my company and I there was a there's a one of our top soccer players back then this was in 2014 when I started my company he he said, I'm, you know I want to employ you to consult for me and build out a, a mental program for me he said but you know, he goes, you need to invoice me. And I didn't have a business back then. I was just like, oh, okay, I guess we're going to start this. I went home, I started my company and it was like, what's your company's name? And I was like, well, you know, it's neuroscience and athletics. And I I was like, it's really neuroathletics. So I started the company like that. And it's literally now a a full service sports neurology agency for athletes. We have 42 athletes one-on-one on on our books, um, spanning from NBA, NFL and major league soccer. Um, And we do everything from brain optimization protocols. We do pre and post scanning of their brains and, it's, um, yeah, it's very, it's my heart and soul. I love that. That's so amazing. I mean, I have so many athletes in my life, pro athletes, my best friends, Olympians. And so, I mean, sport is just a big part of my life. Um, one area in particular is MMA. You know, I have okay. some of my dearest friends are UFC fighters. And I know, you know, I often wonder, you know, taking all these hits to, I, I, it doesn't matter how good you are. You're taking hits to the brain, you know, to the head at, at some point. And I wonder about this. You know, I saw that movie. I forget the name of it with Will Smith years ago. Concussion. Um, Is it? Con- yeah. Concussion. concussion. Yeah. Yes, yeah. That was intense for me to watch that because that was based off a true story. Right. Yes. And, uh-huh. um, you know, I know I, there's a, a, you also are very passionate about concussion and you do a lot of work in this area. Can we talk about that? Because I have so many MMA fighters who listen to the podcast and I think that there's tremendous value to kind of dive into this area. With you. Oh, one, 100%. And if you're talking about brain inflammation, then you're definitely talking about something that occurs when you get a hit. So um, let's separate. You've probably heard of a term called CTE, um, which is what concussion the movie was based mm-hmm. on. Okay, so CTE stands for chronic traumatic encephalopathy, and it is a neurodegenerative disease that is caused by repeated hits to the head. So a concussion is like a blow to the head, and it's often misdiagnosed, and this is why now we have a subspecialty um, called sports neurology in the US at least, because we're really misdiagnosing sports concussions. So a concussion can occur uh, obviously in football or you can just hit your head you can get a minor concussion and depending on how hard you get hit like the velocity and what really happens is when you get hit your brain gets shaken and all those neurochemicals that we spoke about earlier get flown around and it it kind of messes up your head depending on the the concussion you can really damage yourself depending on where you get hit I've seen people get hit in Wernicke's area um, you know different just an area of the brain then they start to lose things like they start to lose language or they can get hearing loss depending on where or think they can get vision loss depending on where they get hit so we've got this concussion crisis right now within the nfl and the nhl we don't see it too much in soccer however you can still get a concussion from hitting a ball okay Mm -hmm. so a concussion is when we get a hit to the head depending at the velocity not everyone who takes a hit, a blow to the head is concussed, okay? There's a certain criteria that you must meet. So if we've got a concussion, what's the problem then? You think, well, okay, great. If we know how to diagnose concussions, we know, well, what's the problem? Well, the problem is in our sport, we, we're letting our players get hit to the head and then go straight back out. Like any wound, okay, you know, when you get, you get punched, you've got a bruise, you want to let it heal. Okay. You don't want to keep punching it. So these players aren't letting themselves rehabilitate that concussion. So they go on and they get another concussion and it's this, it just keeps beating and beating and beating. Then you stop the blood flow. And then what ends up happening is you get 
chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And that's when it's somewhat similar to the phosphorylation of tau protein, where your brain, you know, really gets these clumps and, you know, of the, like the plaques and tangles that I spoke about earlier. And they make athletes or individuals, I should say, do certain things. Uh, We know that, you know, two months ago now, um, I think it was a retired NFL player shot his doctor, his doctor's wife and a son, I believe, or a daughter. And that's devastating, but that is not uncommon. We're hearing a lot of athletes going out and doing this. And the sad thing is with CTE, you can't diagnose it until post-mortem. So someone has to die and they have to go into a brain. If they donate their brain, they go into a brain bank, you cut it open, you see okay, signs of CTE. And you'll really see these big clumps of of blood clots, like clumps, you know, falling out and atrophy to the brain, shrinkage of the brain in certain areas. So it's a, it's, it's really sad. Um, But there is hope, I believe, you know, and I, I've worked, you know, I work with a lot of NFL players and there is hope if they can rehabilitate it. But I would say that anybody who gets concussed, if you, even if you, even if you've got a kid and you're scared yeah. and he's gotten a concussion, the first 24 to 48 hours is ex- extremely crucial for, you know, the rehabilitation of the brain and really getting the brain to lower the temperature, like neural inflammation, the brain is heating up. So we really want to lower the temperature in those times as well. Wow. Yeah. Because I mean, obviously people are going to play their sports. They're going to, you know, they're, it's just, it's like par for the course, right? You're going to take a exactly. puncher, an MMA fighter. You're, so then I just, you know, it kind of brings me back to the question that we touched on a bit, like what can you really be doing to hyper protect your brain, especially knowing that you're, you know um, I mean, knowing that this is naturally going to be happening, like, are we eating very specific type of foods like fish? You know, I mean, yeah. what do you do? It's- well, look, you, you can't, I mean, you know, it's not like you're going to go and eat some ketones and prevent <laughs> someone from hitting into your head. Right. Um, and right. look, another thing is the helmets that are being used in, um, in sport are very heavy as well. And they're aiding in that, um, you know, neck strength is another really big thing when it comes to concussions and, you know, keeping that neck strength in place to prevent the shaking, you know, uh, when you get here. Um, but in terms of really protecting the brain, I, I think if you, there's an, there's a lot of research that's being done on, um, on fat intake in terms of um, having a ketogenic diet as it relates to a post-traumatic insult, such as a concussion. Um, I'm going to be actually delving into that with Dom D'Agostino tomorrow, who's like the the ketosis king. Yeah. I'm going to talk to him about the relationship between that and TBI. So, um, but in terms of really protecting the brain, you want to do everything. I always say that prevention is better than a Band-Aid method. So it's just the exact same things that there is no secret. It literally, it is sleep, good nutrition, um, and really sunlight and, and nature. Yeah. And being consistent, obviously, right. That's the magic, that's correct. the magic pill. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, in MMA, you see, you know, a fighter go through their career and it's interesting. Um, a couple of knockouts, like really, you know, great knockouts, um, that happen in their career, it, it becomes easier for them. It's like they have a, it's all of a sudden they have a weaker chin. And I wonder about that in the brain, like what, what is that? Because maybe they, you know, they were able to take more hits in the earlier parts of their career, but now it's just like one hit the right way and, and they're taken out easier. So I wonder if it is that, yeah, you know, just it's inflammation building process. or something. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, full respect to your time. I want to ask you before a couple of my wrap out questions that I like to ask all my guests, is there anything that you wish people would ask you more about, or, um, that you're really feeling passionate about right now in neuroscience, uh, or that you just want to live in this conversation that we haven't touched on yet? Look right now. So I, um, I'm, I'm working a lot on, so I'm becoming board certified in intraoperative neuromonitoring. So it's, that's, what's taking up a lot of my time. And so I'm very, very excited about that field and understanding, um, you know, we mentioned earlier offline deep brain stimulation, understanding when somebody comes into an OR and they've, um, you know, they've got an intracranial hemorrhage, like you said, or they've had a severe car accident and they have to take off a part of their skull and we have to drop some electrodes in there and see what's happening. I'm really excited to find out 
what and this is an answer for me too like what can we really discover when we drop these electrodes in the brain and what's the effects that we can have on an individual that's when our area i'm really excited about i'm very excited about how sleep can change players not just their performance but their overall uh Eat like the playoffs right now. I've you know I've got a number of athletes who are who are suffering from um, you know they're, they're traveling and it's just it's killing them. It's killing them in every way in terms of sleep. So I'm really important. I'm really interested to find out how can we tra- change the point scoring system or how can we adopt an algorithm that can predict which player is going to lose or which team is going to lose based on how many times that they travel. I think that would be a really interesting thing to understand. Um, But I'm going to be completing, you know, I like to study and delve into certain areas of neuroscience over a long period of time. So I really understand it. And it's still, I'm still on the areas of sleep, um, longevity, and obviously um, my studies. Yeah. I love that. Well, thank you. It's going to be fun to just continuously keep up with you as you're, you know, learning. And again, like I said, at the top of the conversation, I just really feel how just you genuinely are here to support. And I, and I so appreciate that. Um, so one of my questions that I love to ask my guests before we wrap out is if you had a magic, and I feel like I know the answer, but no, if you had a magic wand and you could give the masses one positive habit that would have a large positive ripple effect in their life, what would it be and why? Sleep. Yeah. And it, it, it would be deep. So I think it's a, I think it's inhumane actually um, to not sleep well and I think that we should as a society be uh, rallying together to put in some sort of law around sleep I think sleep has the power to change everybody um, for good and bad and look it also will decrease the amount of car accidents that are happening on the road so yeah truly yeah it'd be a people a really strict sleep schedule I love that. Yeah. People would be calmer, right? Okay. So, uh, the final part is, um, I do, I have these rapid fire words, just a couple words, uh, that oh, I'm gosh. going to, yeah, no, <laughs> anyone who's ever been a competitor at some point or currently is, uh, that comes on my podcast in this sp- specific area. It's really funny. I have to say there's no competition. <laughs> I'm going to throw words at you and you do not have to be rapid in your response and you don't have to give me a one word answer. It's just whatever comes top of mind and top of heart. When you take these words in, um, I would love that feedback from you. Ready? Mm -hmm. First word is love. Family. Oh, do I have to, actually, is this a one word answer? No, it could be whatever you want. Sometimes. Yeah. You can elaborate. Yeah. Well, when I think of pure love, uh, that unconditional love, I see my mom, my dad, my brothers and my nieces. So I relate. Yeah. I love that. Um, fear. Oh, what do I think of when I think of fear? I think it's, um, something that is made up in our heads via uh, society. I love it. Challenge. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love challenges. I think everything is a challenge. I think if I'm not being challenged in a certain area, I'm not growing. And that's actually the the basis of many neurological foundations, such as neuroplasticity. I think we should be challenged in every area. Overcoming challenges is very important. So true. So good. I'm I'm with you on that, girl. Addicted. Uh, next word is passion obsession. I think, um, I look at passion and people say, you're really passionate. I'm like, I think there's more to it than that. Passion is, I love passion. I think I have passion for everything. I have passion for food. I have passion for (laughs) exercise, like passion for the sun. It's like passion, but to have something that's really, I think to be really ultra successful, you have to be obsessed and you have to be more than passionate. Yes. I love it. Courage. Scary courage, having the courage to follow your dreams. If you know what your dreams are, um, can be scary, but a powerful thing. Resilience. Resilience. Um, just, I think about resilience. I think about, uh, not stopping until you're dead. <laughs> I love it. That's what my coach used to say. He's like, you do not stop pedaling unless you, unless you die. I was like, oh my God. And every time I stopped pedaling, he's like, no. I was like, okay. (laughs) I 
love that. Sometimes when I'm training and I have so many different forms of training, but I'll tell myself, uh, like I do these long, deep sand beach runs in the backyard and, you know, like six miles or whatever. It's long for me anyways, but, um, you know, sometimes it's just really hard. And I tell myself, if you're going to fall, fall, just fall. Mm. You're okay. You're safe, but just keep mm -hmm. going. <laughs> then we'll crawl. Yeah. Um, the final word is excellence. What do I think of when I think of excellence? I what do you think, feel? Oh, I, oh, that's right. You ask me what I feel. I'm telling you what I think. Uh, when I, uh, excellence, I feel something that you really try really hard in and you do it to the best of your ability. I love it. Well, Lisa, thank you so much. Um, I'm really, really grateful. You know, neuroscience obviously is like a, a, a universe in of itself. And I'm not a neuroscientist, but I'm a total geek in, in this universe. And, you know, when we talk about human potential, how to get 1% better every day, how to optimize it, how to live from your fullest potential, you cannot ignore you know, this universe, this neuroscience and, and, and my, my goal and one of the greatest gifts about having this podcast is that I can bring on incredible people like you who not only have the information, but are able to communicate it in a way where we can kind of distill it down so that our everyday people can take in parts of it and apply it because that's, I mean, there's obviously so much value to this. You don't need to be a pro athlete or a high level intellect or someone who's, but you know, all of this stuff is so important for everyday people. So um, yeah. it's just an honor to have you on. I appreciate no, you and I'm you. very grateful to be connected. Yeah. And if anybody um, is interested in my company shoots out a, a free newsletter and it goes out to over 15,000 people. So I would definitely tell people, I don't know if you've signed up for it, but um, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's an amazing email that talks about all of these subjects and it's all around centering around how can we get an athlete to perform better? And when I say athlete, I mean, anybody, it doesn't mean just an athlete. Right. Right. Cause life is a sport, right? Correct. So. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. I love it. Great. So everything will be in the show notes. So to stay connected, I love your IG. You're always putting out great information. Clubhouse too. Where are the best places to send people? Uh, Instagram, Twitter. I'm, um, I'm a fan of Twitter and you can follow my podcast and definitely Substack. So it's my, if you just go to the link in my um, Instagram, you'll find it. And oh God, thank you for saying that. Your podcast you. is truly one of my favorites, truly. Thank you so much. I listen to your podcast before I go to bed at night. That's my Netflix. I'm not kidding. <laughs> oh my God, I love that. I'm not thank even you so kidding. Much. You're such a geek. No, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. <laughs> thank you, girl. To be continued. Talk soon. <laughs>